In 1961, many would argue that the most beautiful cars came from Maranello, Italy. How about Ferrari's 250 GT SWB Berlinetta Coupe or the California Spider? So, when Enzo Ferrari, the maestro of automotive aesthetics, bestowed the title of the most beautiful car ever made, one would naturally assume he was gushing over one of his sculpted masterpieces. No, his admiration was aimed at a different direction, the just-released Jaguar E-Type. With its captivating long bonnet, unassuming grille, and unmistakable silhouette, this British marble left even Ferrari himself in awe. But before we begin delving into the story behind the Jaguar E-Type's timeless elegance, don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more captivating automotive tales. Imagine a time when cars all looked a bit the same, nothing really exciting, but then BAM! The Jaguar E-Type hit the road and turned heads. People of all ages went wild for it, and guess what? That love hasn't gone away, not even a little bit. The secret? Well, it's all in the looks. While other cars were kinda plain, the E-Type was like a superhero among sidekicks. Check this out. Back in 1961, Ferrari, Maserati, and Alfa Romeo also showed off new cars. But who remembers those now? If you told car fans about the Geneva Motor Show, they'd probably shout E-Type in a heartbeat. People are still crazy about it. And here's the cool part. You can still find spare parts to keep E-Types cruising down the road. Everything from big stuff like body parts to tiny things that are super hard to find for other cars. You won't believe it, but you can even get a brand new version of the XK engine. In fact, in 2015, Jaguar Classic went all out and built eight shiny new E-Types that look just like the old ones. And guess what? Before the first one was even done, they were snatched up by eager buyers. This car doesn't just have fans, it's got a worldwide fan club. When the E-Type popped up, it wasn't meant to push out the older XK cars. Nope, the XK140 was showing its age, and Jaguar needed a fresh face. Imagine the big boss saying, let's jazz up the XK150 a bit and call it a day. While all this was going on, there were these brainy folks at Jaguar's experimental department. They were led by a cool cat named William Haynes. They had some leftover race cars, D-types, and they turned them into open-top road cars. But then, whoosh, a fire happened and things got a bit crazy. They all went down while the XK150 was strutting its stuff. In the middle of all this hustle and bustle, Haynes told another genius named Tom Jones to whip up a new car that could be as cool as the famous D-type race car. Jones and his crew had just six months to work their magic. They built a prototype with a secret codename, E. It was like mixing the old D-Type with something fresh and snazzy. Too bad there weren't any snapshots of this early version. It had a small engine and a fancy suspension, but it wasn't quite ready for the spotlight. Jaguar was crazy busy making regular cars and racing them, so the E-Type project had to take a chill pill. The D-Types got sold off, and the E-Type prototype got taken apart. But Haynes wasn't giving up. He wanted a street version of that E-Type, and he talked the big boss into letting them do it. A dude named Malcolm Sayer drew the body, and Tom Jones handled the nuts and bolts stuff. Picture a small, slick car with a longer wheelbase than the D-Type. It was simple and drop-dead gorgeous. They called it E-1A which is just a fancy way of saying experimental one aluminium. They tinkered with it, tested it, and even took it for a spin on a track. That's how the legend began, my friends. The E1A prototype went through some makeover madness over the next few months. And here's the twist. They put the independent rear suspension, IRS, in its own special frame for any future cars. This baby could hit 120 miles per hour, 190 kilometers per hour like it was nothing. But even though the E1A kept getting tested by Dewis and his pals at Jaguar, it had done its job and was eventually taken apart. 
Now, don't think of this car as the prototype E-Type. No, it wasn't meant to be. It was more like a cool experiment to try out different ideas, especially that fancy independent rear suspension thing. As time went on, the E1A changed and evolved into the E-Type we all know and love. Here's where it gets interesting. The IRS, that special suspension thing, was originally fixed solidly to the E1A body. But guess what? Vibrations were a problem, so they had to make some changes. A whiz named Bob Knight did some tinkering. He redesigned the whole suspension to sit in its own special home, attached to the body with rubber bits to make it all comfy and quiet. No metal rubbing against metal. It was like a cushion against the road noise. This fix got rid of the vibrations, and after a few more tweaks, they were ready to draw up the final plans and put this baby into production for 1961. Now, let's talk about the front part of the car, the part that hits the road first. It wasn't anything super fancy. It borrowed the design from the XK120, C-Type and D-Type cars. They used something called double wishbones and longitudinal torsion bars. Fancy car talk for a proven design that made the ride smooth. They cleverly sent the spring's power straight into the main body of the car, so things didn't get too bumpy where the wishbones met the car's frame. Plus, they used smaller wheels this time, which made the car sit lower and stick to the road better. Before the E1A got the boot in 1958, the smart folks at Jaguar were busy working on a bigger version. This plywood and metal model had a longer wheelbase and was held together with pop rivets, those little things that go pop when you put them in. But then a wild idea struck. The big boss Haynes said, let's make this into a real car. So they ditched the pop rivets, made the frame stronger with metal, and voila, in just a week they turned it into a real working car. Now, this riveted beauty, called the Pop Rivet Special, was more like the actual E-Type than the E1A. But here's the funny thing. Before it hit the road, most of those Pop Rivets got taken out, but the nickname stuck. On March 20th, 1958, this car, painted pearl grey, hit the streets. Kinda. It shook, rattled, and wasn't exactly a smooth ride due to its peculiar construction. But hey! They were onto something. At the same time, the experimental shop was cooking up another E-Type prototype with the chassis number 850001. This one was Cotswold Blue and looked closer to the final deal. The front was like the E-Type we know, but the back still had a bit of that D-Type look. By June 1959, the Cotswold Blue E-Type was ready for action. They put it through its paces at Mira with Dewis at the wheel. Meanwhile, the pop rivet version was used for testing for about four months. And guess what? Sayer used all this info to create a third version that was even more like the E-Time that eventually built. Imagine a sturdy frame up front carrying the engine in suspension with a cool trick. The whole front section opened up like a treasure chest to reach the engine. The middle part had some special touches too. Strong panels joined to a frame that added muscle to the body. And at the back, they had a rear section that was tough and ready to handle the suspension and drive axle. They made sure this baby was strong, so they didn't need to add extra stuff for the open-top version. The body and frame did all the hard work. Oh, and don't forget about the first steel body. They started making it, but it never got finished or painted, and the records say it got scrapped. No one's really sure what it was used for. Maybe they tested how strong it was or practiced building techniques, but that's just a guess. As the testing and development phase continued, Jaguar engineers spared no effort in refining the prototypes for performance, handling, and overall quality. The third E-Type prototype, a metallic gray model equipped with a 3.4-liter XK engine, replaced the pop rivet example in the program. This new prototype underwent intensive trials where various modifications were applied, such as changes in weight distribution, different tire options, adjustments to suspension components, radiator variations, and options for final drive ratios. This rigorous testing aimed to optimize the car's performance in diverse conditions. By July 1960, 
there were four E-type prototypes in the testing program, two fixed-head coupes and two open roadsters. The grand debut of the E-type took place at the 1961 Geneva Motor Show on March 50. The anticipation was palpable as a large crowd gathered around the Jaguar stand where a wooden crate concealed the new masterpiece. The crate was raised, unveiling a stunning opalescent gunmetal E-type fixed head coupe 885005, the sole E-type available for static display within the exhibition hall. Norman Dewis, instrumental in the E-Type's development, played a crucial role in bringing a second E-Type to the Parc des Orvives outside the hall due to the overwhelming demand for photography and test rides. Jaguar's strategic move to showcase the E-Type at the New York International Motor Show in 1961 further solidified its global presence. With the help of the elegantly dressed model and actress Marilyn Hanold, the E-Type garnered significant attention at the event. The E-Type's popularity was evident in the six cars sold within the first 30 minutes of the show's opening, and over 2,000 orders were placed. This unprecedented demand not only validated Jaguar's design and engineering prowess, but also helped boost revenue for a recovering post-war Britain. If you enjoyed this story, buckle up and stay tuned for more fascinating tales about your favorite car brands. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for a joyride through the world of automotive history. Thanks for watching and see you soon.